So life itself, it's increasingly becoming digital, connected, intelligent, data-driven, crowdsourced, and collaborative, particularly at the interface and the convergence of many technologies we've been hearing about at this gathering. And you know, 10 years ago, I was lucky to give a TED talk about medicine's future. There's an app for that, about 25,000 apps at the time. And the theme was that this convergence, this super convergence, was making technology sort of faster, better, cheaper, more available, and really enabling us to, to rethink and reimagine healthcare across the care continuum, creating new fields and new insights, new innovations, many of which didn't exist 20-something years ago when I was a Stanford medical student. And I think we've seen at Life Itself the opportunity to take these new ideas and leverage them to reimagine health and medicine across the care continuum. Now, that's a big mission, to go from this past to this future, leveraging a lot of the insights that we've had in this room and many of you are developing. But you know, we're still stuck in 2022, it used to be the future. When I go back and visit Mass General Hospital where I trained as a resident, you know, we're still sometimes in the fax machine era, still using paper forms. At Stanford, I had a cardiac study done a couple weeks ago. I got my results on a CD-ROM. I don't even own a CD-ROM player anymore. I'm not sure about you. So we're sometimes stuck a bit in the past. Um, we're still leveraging waiting rooms, and we silo the way we define our medical professions in ways that haven't changed in, in eons. Um, and we don't really integrate the information across fields as we could. So we have tremendous opportunities to rethink things just, and disrupt health and medicine, just like many fields have changed from how we disrupted how we did our digital banking and digital entertainment. And of course, our world has been horribly disrupted over the past couple of years through the pandemic. And it's been a bit of a forcing function to show that while many fields have reached the fourth industrial age, health and medicine is sometimes stuck in the third or maybe even the second. So COVID's been a bit of a chief transformation officer. And I think it gives us a bit of a catalyst. Just like Sputnik has set up a, the space age, COVID is sparking a bit of a, a new health age. We need to take that energy and the innovations and diagnostics, therapeutics, new thinking to move us forward in this health age. So I was lucky to give a TED talk just last year about how COVID has transformed this future of medicine. And I gave a bit of a lens I thought I'd share today about looking back 10 years from that past talk to where we are now and where we might be in the next decade. As Bill Gates shared this famous quote, most people tend to overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in the next 10. I think the next decade will make the last 10 years actually look slow. So where are we? You know, I started my TED talk 10 years ago about the, the genomics of the time. I met my distant cousin, Harriet, because we shared a similar haplotype. As we heard now, the price of sequencing has dropped from $10,000 10 years ago to almost $100. Soon it'll be maybe $10 in the next decade. We'll leverage that to do smart pharma pharmacogenetics, picking the right drug at the right dose. We'll understand common diseases, not just type 2 diabetes, but their genetic and the molecular level. We'll not just use genomics, but the increasing leverage of the proteome, the exposome, the microbiome, the bugs inside our bodies, et cetera, that leverage so much impact on disease. And we'll start to layer these omics up in new ways to put them together to create true sort of digital twins to enable us to truly predict and optimize health span, diagnostics, and therapy that truly meet and match the individual. Particularly in my field of pediatric oncology, where we heard about yesterday cancer, whether it's a immunotherapy or a new uh, pharmaceutical, all those need to be personalized to the individual. So exponentials are at play. The world is accelerating. The classic one, of course, is Moore's Law, the power of computing, which is why now many technologies have completely been digitized. They've been dematerialized. They're almost free, and then they can be democratized and spread around the world at the instant of a press of a button. And quantum computing, by the way, is coming next in this exciting decade. So my favorite exponential, of course, is you know, the smartphone. Uh, you know, remember like 35 years ago, Michael Douglas on the beach with a phone? That seemed kind of crazy, right? It's only been 15 years since the first iPhones. I still have my antique iPhone 2. It still works when I use it. It felt amazing then. It feels slow and clunky now. My iPhone 13 will soon feel antique. And of course, those are going to begin dissolving into our eyeglasses, into our augmented reality contact lenses, which will have healthcare applications as well. And we'll see the example from 10 years ago, the first diagnostics integrated into a smartphone for measuring blood sugar, or the first sort of hack EKG 10 years ago that was a novel thing. Now you can see ads on CNN, and you can buy your own personal six-lead EKG uh, device to track AFib or other medical conditions. So exponentials are all around us. The blood pressure cuff is disappearing into a cuff, or super will be on your wrist or a patch to measure not just blood sugar uh, continuously, but blood pressure. So new forms of information are coming. And a lot of those already exist as possibilities on our magical medicalized smartphones. The camera itself can pick up our vital signs, our heart rate, our blood pressure, our oxygen saturation uh, without any vital monitor at all. So the invisibles are sort of here. We're in the realm of being able to take our medicalized smartphone and take the current sensors and check your kid's ear to see if they have an ear infection. Or uh, take a medical selfie of a wound and understand how to measure it and treat it. 
The exponential power of the smartphone camera can mean you don't need to take your urine to the lab to check for a UTI or preeclampsia, early signs of kidney disease. You can just dip your urine, take a picture with your smartphone, and instantly the information is diagnosed, sent to your doctor, to your pharmacist, and beyond. Easy peasy. So our smartphone microphones can pick up voice as a biomarker for mental health, for early signs of neurologic disorders. Uh, is that cough, COVID, uh, coronavirus, uh, or croup? All can be diagnosed from voice as a biomarker. And of course, our behaviors now leverage through our phones. Genetics plays a role, but our behaviors, particularly over our lifespans, drive most of our chronic disease and costs. And you know, the first wearables really only came about, like the Fitbit, 12, 13 years ago. Now we have wearables that can measure almost every element of physiology and behavior. I'm wearing like four different versions or five different versions today. <laughs> Now, the opportunity there is not to just have a patchable that can track vitals and be powered by your body movements, or sockables to track the health of a diabetic foot, or even underwearables, which are here, I won't show you mine, which can now align with incentives, reimbursement codes for remote patient monitoring, can enable you to monitor a patient with COPD or COVID remotely. The rings that many of us are wearing, think about all the exponential technology that can track our health and our sleep is now being leveraged in new ways, not just for sleep, but can pick up signs of pregnancy days before a pregnancy test normally would, or can determine how you responded to a COVID vaccine just for a consumer-based wearable. Patches are now evolving that can give you basically an intensive care unit level of data on a simple patch that can last for months, streaming and ICU level data. How do we leverage this information into the workflow of clinical care? They're breathables that cannot just check the quality of your breath, but maybe signs of early metabolic disease or cancers, sniffing out disease from breath. So we'll be able to quantify many early interesting things. But it can be simple quantification. You're sending a patient home after a total hip replacement. Are they walking more, as you might expect, or walking less? And if they're walking less, might we intervene early before the fall or the readmission? And of course, we can start to quantify our most important drug, food. You can start to measure your inputs in all sorts of interesting data-driven ways. And truly, your outputs will soon be measured in your home, whether you like it or not. And we'll start to leverage genome, microbiome, metabolome to drive true precision nutrition, particularly putting on my pediatrician hat uh, for early uh, childhood nutrition and long-term health. So we have all these new possibilities at our fingertips. We're in an age where in the next decade, our digitome will be collected, our digital exhaust 24-7. How do we leverage that information? It might be my AI-coded MRI of my brain or my full-body MRI. We might use that sort of information proactively to pick uh, early signs of dementias, other neurologic issues, or Lewy body dementia, for example, from our digital fingerprints or our eye tracking on a video game. We can have full body MRIs down now for a couple thousand dollars in just 45 minutes. And the next day, we'll see the ability to go to your CVS or Walmart and get a full body scan, maybe in 10 minutes, read by the AI radiologist. And the imaging devices themselves are getting smaller and more mobile and more portable. I have my own brain MRI down on a boat going down the Hudson River in five minutes, plugged into wall power. Or as we heard from Mary Lou Jepson with open water, these will soon be wearable diagnostics. So in this exponential age, diagnostics will come to our digital doctor's bag or that of the community health worker. It can enable all of us to be up-level, to listen to your heart sounds and diagnose the murmur, as well as a highly trained cardiologist, or bring AI-empowered uh, consumer ultrasound devices. It used to be $200,000, and now they're less than $2,000. They can democratize who and where. We can do diagnostics and uh, um, democratize that around the planet for folks who didn't have any sort of diagnostics currently. And all this new information, diagnostics and beyond, needs a bit of help, right? Not just AI, artificial intelligence, but IA, intelligence augmentation. And of course, there's been a bit of hype. We've talked a lot about AI. You remember IBM Watson 10 years ago? That reminds me, of course, of Amara's Law. We sometimes overestimate the effect of technology in the short run, but underestimate in the long run. And that's all now coming to a head. This next decade, if we leverage together, can be quite impactful. To augment the radiologist, not replace them. To change pathology, but much more digital. Not just to determine if that's a cancer, but it's molecular fingerprint and outcome likelihoods. Uh, we can augment the gastroenterologist to find a lesion that might have been missed. Or increasingly use AI to find problems before they occur, like sepsis or a medical error. Now, of course, this can enable us to have more time for the human side of healthcare. It's not human versus machine. AI is not going to replace your doctor, your nurse, versus your pharmacist. But those using AI machine learning will start to replace those who don't. And this has brought us to this new age of connected, mobile, digital health that's been exploding on the scene. I like to think about digital health, about the ability to connect all the dots between these new forms of information, to make sense of that, an app or service that really matches the individual, the patient, the caregiver, the healthcare system based on age, culture, language. And, and it, there's new data to back up that these technologies are actually impactful. We're now prescribing FDA-cleared apps, digiceuticals, not just a drug or a device. There's an explosion of apps that might treat mental health, smoking cessation, digital health platforms that can treat anxiety, depression, and beyond. And 
Even prescription FDA cleared video games to treat ADHD without medication. Now the challenge is there's almost too many apps. There's now in the last decade 350,000 apps and other solutions. We don't want one app for every condition. We want kind of the one ring or the one app to start to rule them all. We need ways to translate the solutions to today. And that part of that is this shift from quantified self to quantified health. The opportunity to take all this new data and stream it to our healthcare systems for optimizing health span, early diagnostics, early therapy. We can now do that through our smart devices and platforms like Verily are starting to connect that and collect that from thousands of patients, sharing their digital exhaust and data so we can make sense of that, have true predictalytics, a bit of an individualized FICO score for each of us, or a check engine light for our health data to make sense of that before we sort of crash our car. So that's where we're sort of heading. You know, our smartwatch today can determine if you have COVID even before you're, you're symptomatic. And so we're entering an era of almost minority report where we're gonna diagnose disease at stage zero rather than stage three. But this is a challenge, this opportunity. It's all these new solutions out there. How do we make sense of that? So I've been trying to address that by launching a new platform launched today. The website's digital.health, easy to remember, where it's a bit of a digital health formulae, where you can go to digital.health and, for example, you're looking for solutions around uh, diagnostics, around atrial fibrillation. You might want to find a, an Alive core device that you can measure AFib and prescribe that to a patient, put it in your own formulary, or prescribe that to deliver it to a patient electronically or through their smart device. Or you're looking for solutions for uh, diabetes care. Uh, it might be related to uh, therapeutics that are driven by diet and nutrition, like Verda, that can start to reverse type 2 diabetes. Or new solutions for common problems like hypertension, or the whole explosion of digital health solutions around mental health. So please use that platform to find solutions or add those to the database so we can really translate digital health uh, to reality. And now the opportunity is to take all these multiple data streams and help them really impact the flow of, of healthcare. The challenge often is the workflow. What is it, Doc? Just as I thought you're generating too much data, none of us as clinicians want the data, we want the actual insights. We need to close the loop. We need to think about the workflow elements that often contribute to the burnout of many clinicians today, that sort of fourth quadruple aim that the technology is gonna improve the, uh, the experience for the clinician across the care continuum. Part of the solution now is crowdsourcing. I mean, think about 15 years ago, we still drove with paper maps. Now we couldn't imagine driving without Google Maps or Waze. Imagine if we all could start to build a Google Maps or Waze for healthcare, leveraging that information so that we're not just organ donors or blood donors, but data donors. And we're leveraging that data to empower each of us as, as patients to be more empowered and connected and to be true co-pilots of care and leverage that into this new era of accelerated digital-enabled clinical trials where you can download the app, have the drugs delivered by drone, and uh, do a clinical trial much faster with better outcome. And we're seeing examples of that, whether it's for microdosing or platforms like Stuff That Works, which has millions of individuals sharing what's working and what's not working. Now, COVID and this new feature has augmented our way we practice. Telemedicine exploded in, the, in this new era. It's taking us from the world of sick care based on intermittent episodic data only collected in the four walls of the clinic to a world of, uh, and, and that leads to our reactive mindset. We tend to wait for the patient to show up with a heart attack or a stroke or in my world of oncology, late stage cancer. We're coming to this era of continuous, proactive information that can be delivered anytime, anywhere, at low cost, with better outcomes and, uh, and more equity. And we're moving that information from the hospital to the home hospital. All these technologies are shifting where care happens. And these virtual visits won't just be on a screen. Increasingly, there'll be chatbots that learn you and do smart triage. We're entering the, not just the metaverse, but the metaverse. How you interact with care will expand in this world of AR, VR, and XR. So we need to teach our clinicians not just good bedside manner, but good website manner uh, going forward and leverage that technology in the future of medical education. I train C1, do one, teach one. The future of medical education will increasingly be C1, simulate, simulate, and simulate before you even touch a patient. I'd like to see how all this might integrate into this future uh, new ways. We heard about 3D printing yesterday. How do we leverage AI, machine learning, new data to pick the right medications, the right dosings? They're often uh, one size fits all. What if we could sort of print a personalized poly pill that was built for you, based on you, and really adapted to you, a pill ba based on generics, common drugs that are taken together, but can really be the dose that matters for you. Might adjust your, your blood thinner or your diuretic. Um, and uh, maybe print that pill every morning uh, to optimize your lifespan or to treat a chronic or an acute disease, eventually on your kitchen counter. So that's where I think some of this can integrate. Of course, technology is part of this new solution, but as we talked about at this amazing gathering, social determinants play such a key role, uh, including in the disparities we've seen through the pandemic. So we don't need to just think about the social determinants of health, but increasingly the digital determinants of health. Does your patient have a digital plan? Do they have good battery life, Wi-Fi? Uh, half the world's population doesn't have internet access. Soon they will through platforms like Starlink. So we need to think about leveraging that new technology to, uh, around the world. And this new 
healthcare internet of things, not just internet of medical things, creates realms of new data. We don't just want data. We want to increase the speed of going from data to information insights and narrow that gap, which is often 17 years, to bring that information to utility. And I've been leading and sharing the XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance Task Force. Part of it's been data-driven, 100 plus organizations sharing data, new insights to address the challenges of the pandemic. And increasingly, now it's the Health and Pandemic Alliance. It's Health of Future Publishers Collaborative. So please join us in addressing the challenges of healthcare. So I think we have a new bright health age ahead. It's not about any one technology. It's about the power of these rapidly progressing, sometimes exponential technologies and ideas at their convergence. Sometimes it's not about the new ideas, but the old ideas that we need to escape from as we bring us this new health age. And I think if we think about where we are today, incredibly 2022, and skate like Wayne Gretzky to where the puck will be, we can now move forward, not in incremental medicine, but one of accelerated past the future, from intermittent reactive sick care to one that's continuous, proactive, personalized, crowdsourced, AI-enhanced healthcare. So let's not take incremental steps. Let's take exponential ones. The future of health and medicine, as we've seen here this week, is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And so up to all of us, collaborating not to just predict that future of health and medicine and life itself, but to build a better future of health itself for all of us here on Spaceship Earth. So thank you. Let's build that future.